In this video, I'm going to react to over 100 Dungeon Master tips posted on Facebook. So there's this really good Facebook group called Dungeon Master Resources. I highly recommend it. There was recently a post on there asking for Dungeon Master tips. Uh, here's what it says. It says, I'm making a big list of quick tips for DMs. I'll start. Prioritize fun over rules. Your turn. Go. So, and that post got, as you can see, like 200 plus comments. And a lot of them were really good Dungeon Master tips. So in this video, I'm going to react to them and kind of keep a tally if I agree or disagree with the tips and keep a running total. And we'll see at the end of the video if uh, I agree with Facebook or mostly disagree or or what. So if you want to, you can play along and, and kind of see if you agree with, with them or disagree with them or, or how you know what your feelings are. So let's get right to it. Okay, so in OP's post, it says prioritize fun over rules. Now, I tend to agree, but I also think that part of the fun is that all the players know all the rules and they're playing a game constrained by the rules. So I would say it's not uh, one or the other. I would say fun and rules are not a binary choice. So I'm gonna have to go with, I, uh, I'm gonna say neutral on this because I don't necessarily agree, but I don't necessarily disagree. Next up, please, for the love of Odin, try other systems and not just 5e slash Pathfinder, etc. Okay, yeah, I agree with this. I really like the Star Wars D6 system. It's one of my favorites. But yeah, man, why, why would you just play one game? I agree. All right, here we go. Nat 20s do not auto succeed on anything but attack rolls. Nat 1s do not auto fail on anything except attack rolls. Don't let your bards convince the king to hand over rulership of the kingdom. DC 40 exists for a reason. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I totally agree with this. This is, this is what the rules are. Uh, I don't know what the... DC 40 thing is all about. Yeah, if a task is impossible, you know, if a task is impossible, the dungeon master should not ask for a roll. End of story. And the whole, um, there is this argument of, well, when they roll, you can see how badly they failed or whatever. Nah, I disagree. If it's impossible, don't roll. Move on. Let the dungeon master narrate the results. Next up, tip number four. You are not a novelist. Let the story write itself at the table. 100% agree. I've been in a lot, <laughs> over the years, I've been in a lot of games where it seemed like the dungeon master was trying to, I don't know, like have this like overarching story that he would guide the players through. No, nah, that's, that's not it. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta have the players play the game and then the story emerges from the gameplay. That's my opinion. So on this one, hundred percent agree. It's okay to have a narrative type game. Storylines are great, but the story needs to write itself at the table, not in the head of the dungeon master. hundred percent agree. Next up, <laughs> number five, what am I on? Number five. Kill a PC in session one to establish dominance. Okay, now that's funny. Obviously, uh, I don't. as far as the Dungeon Master tip is concerned, I don't agree. <laughs> so put that in don't agree, but it's funny. Moving on. Number six. Every session, each player should have a spotlight. Agree. Yeah. You gotta, as the Dungeon Master, you're almost kind of a master of ceremonies as well. You kind of have to get a, read the room and make sure everybody's, you know, gets their turn. So a lot of times, you know, you're, you can point somebody, you know, what is so-and-so, what do you think about this? Or, you know, what, what would your character do, et cetera. You know, you can kind of call on people to um, make sure that everybody gets their chance to speak up. I agree with this. Next up. <laughs> what are we on? Number seven. Improvisation is a feature, not a flaw. 100% agree. This is, so you'll find very quickly, like when you start dungeon mastering, that you can prep as much as you want, but the players are just going to do their own thing. So you need to more or less kind of have a, you kind of need to know how the world is going to react to the players, not necessarily a set path the players are going to go on. You just kind of need to know how different NPCs and different environments are going to react to what the players could do. But yeah, 100% agree. 90% of being a dungeon master is improvisation. It's not the players versus the DM. It's the players and the DM versus the bad guys. Now, I don't know if I agree or disagree with this one, because when you're the dungeon master, you're controlling the bad guys and you're not against the bad guys. So I, I guess I don't really understand this one. I think it's not, I know it is not the players versus the DM. That's true. First part is true. The DM versus the bad guy, players and DM versus the bad guys. Eh, not sure I agree. So I'm, I'm kind of neutral on this one because I agree with the first part. I don't really understand the second part. All right, next up to quote Matt Colville. Encounter design does not end when initiative is rolled. Stay on your toes. Don't be afraid to change things on the fly if it will make for a better story. Hmm. Now this is, you can kind of, kind of tell, some, you know, there's kind of two schools of thought in, in the D&D world. One of them is this uh, hyper-focus on story, and then another one you might say it's hyper-focused on gameplay, rules, optimizing characters, and stuff like that. Don't be afraid to change things on the fly if it will make for a better story. Okay, I kind of, I would agree with that in the sense of if it would make the encounter 
more interesting. I'm not necessarily worried about a story, but I am interested in the players having fun and being challenged and feeling satisfied that they overcame challenges. So if you're talking about change things on the fly, like lower the hit points of a creature or add reinforcements, yeah, I, I can see that. But generally, I would probably skew to making things harder than making things easier on the party, just so that they don't feel like uh, any successes are unearned. And you know, and if I was to be asked, hey, did you, you know, go easy on us? I'd say, no, I don't, I don't go easy. You know, the dice say what they say, etc. You know, let's move on. I, do I agree or not? I agree. Yeah, because like when it, you know, I agree. If, if you're running the combat, it's not locked in to what's going on. There could be changes. Um, granted, combat takes place very rapidly in Dungeons & Dragons. Every round is only six seconds. So you got to think like, wow, the reinforcements came at the exact six second window when the battle happened. But hey, it is what it is. It, it's a game. If you need to add some goblins, add some goblins. If you need to make the Goblin King start running away on his wolf mount, you know, instead of fighting to the death. Yeah, do those things. Uh, all right, moving on. I guess I agree. Next up, no matter how thoroughly you plan out the options your players may take, they will find more. So don't get stuck in the mindset that they can only do some things a particular way. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely agree. I think anybody who's ran a game would know that the players pretty much never do what you think they're going to do. So yeah, agree. <laughs> Good one. Learn the rules before you start removing them. 100% agree. So a lot of times people will, you know, it's notorious online, these homebrew options and homebrew classes and all these things. Yeah, some of them are really cool and all this, but there's kind of this perception that they're all overpowered and broken and this, that, and the other. And it's usually because people didn't learn the rules before they removed them or they don't understand the basic concept of game design and game balance. Yeah, agree. Next up. Know your weaknesses and plan for them. If someone asks me an NPC's name, etc., I freeze. So now I have a list of names next to me. I just slot in quickly. I know what I can make up on the fly and what I struggle with. So have what I struggle with ready to help. Okay, 100% agree. I have a name of NPC, like a pre-printed name of, you know, name list to pull from because that's like such a common one. The players are like, let's go talk to the horse trainer guy or whatever. Okay, well now you're you're pulling this this name up. And, and if you have a name ready, it just makes, you can give the illusion that, that there's more going on behind the curtain than there than there may or may not be. 100% agree. Homebrewing content makes the game fit to your player characters better, whether that's magical items or devious monsters. Yeah. I agree with that. Absolutely. You know, like say that they're in some swamp environment, let's say, and you throw in, I don't know, a special kind of orc or a special kind of cobalt or something that is kind of swamp related. You know, say you say, say you homebrew this cobalt to be black skinned and can hide in, in the swampy waters and, and things like this. Yeah, absolutely. Make the game fit the environment and the players. Absolutely agree. I'm new to all of these, but how about choose kindness before everything else and demand kindness from others too. Demand kindness. Agree. I've been DMing for a year and my players have only this week done some of the major side quests I dangled in front of them in session one. In short, don't plan too much. They'll always pick the that you just come up with. Yeah. 100% uh, agree. Now, one of the things I do is when they're talking to an NPC, if it's a prolonged conversation, generally I'm going to slip in there some sort of like hint or something like this, like some sort of reference to something that they don't know anything about. I don't know anything about, but it's just kind of like a thread to pull at. So say they're talking to the shopkeeper about this, that, and the other, the mountain and the treasure under the hill and all this stuff. But you can throw in there, yeah, it's like old man malarkey down at the graveyard said these things are moving at night. Or, you know, you could throw in some thread that if the players want to pull at, they can pull at. I like to do it. That's how the, the story emerges. Agree. Everyone at the table is playing a game. You are all on the same team. Absolutely. Agree. Choose your players wisely. Oh, absolutely, yes. We've all heard stories of that guy. Uh, can't agree enough. Be consistent. I think that's just... Good life advice in general. Agree. If the party are steamrolling your monsters, give them an edge or make the party's job difficult. I guess I mean give the monsters an edge. Yeah, I agree. If if especially if you're running like a pre-written module or something like that, and the with the the way power creep is uh, in games like this, uh, you know there could be an adventure written six years ago, but then in the intervening years. There's been more powerful player options, and then not only that, theory crafting. And people come up with very, very good uh, characters that can, like, like this post is saying, steamroll the monsters. Yeah, buff them up. And now, generally, what I like to do is add more instead of like, oh, well, this guy has plus 50 hit points. To me, that's boring. 
Uh, I'd like to add, you know, add two extra goblins in the back, but, you know, one of them is a, like a sorcerer type goblin and one's a cleric type goblin or something like that. And that makes things more interesting. All right. Next up, never let them see your rolls and never tell them what the DC is and was. I disagree. 100% disagree. I, I do all my rolls in the open. And sometimes I, if it is a dramatic moment, I like to tell them what the DC is. And that way the whole table can kind of like, they look at that dice and it's like suspenseful. And it's very, it creates these exciting moments. If you could, oh, I don't know what a good example is. You know, say I'm going to swing across the rope to the tower. I don't know, kick in the window, whatever. Whatever the, the dramatic thing that's happening is, but say it's crucial, it's clutch. You tell them, all right, the DC is 15. You know, you got to, whatever, your plus five bonus, you know? 10 or higher, you're there. 10 or less, not so much. And then, you know, maybe if it's if it's a, a very crucial moment, the you know, maybe people stand up, look, wait for that dice. It's big dramatic, you roll, you know, see what happens, cheer, groan. Yeah, uh, so then, in short, disagree. Roll in the open, that's my opinion. It's a game, the fun of a game, the fun of this game is a lot of it's the dice rolls and the suspense of, you know, what, what fate has in store for us. So yeah, let them see the dice. That's my opinion. Make your own version of the deck of many things. Yeah, I'll go with that. That's awesome. I mean, sounds awesome to me. Make your own version of everything. But <laughs> it actually would be kind of, you know, there might, I don't know how this would play out in the real world because negative emotions come from a mismatch between expectations and reality. So if they were, the players were to find a magical deck of cards, they're going to be thinking it's a deck of many things. And and when they find out that it's not, there could be some disappointment, but it could also, it depends on your players, you know, so they may be disappointed or they may be excited if it's a, you know, say it's a, a deck of many things, but it's the lower level version where it's not so harsh and not so, but you know, instead of getting 50,000 XP or whatever, you know, a thousand XP, you know, and then instead of death haunting you until you die, it could be a wraith hunts you or something. Yeah, sure. Make your own deck of many things. I agree. Cool. Make your own, make your own everything. Next monster HP doesn't need to be a set parameter from a stat block. It's a reference point and it can be adjusted on the fly. Too strong? Knock down. Too weak? Double it. A PC made a crazy plan and got two crits in a row? Let them have the win. Yes, I agree, but with some caveats. A, you gotta keep in mind that this is a game and people are gathering together and they have agreed to play a game. They've agreed to play Dungeons and Dragons and monsters have certain stats in the book, characters have certain stats from the book, and this is an agreed upon, let's say, social contract. We're playing this game. So if you're changing things too much, at some point it's like the Monopoly banker stealing money kind of thing. Like you're not playing the game. So while I do agree with this, I tend to, like I said earlier, I tend to like to add monsters, but with the same stats. And then if they defeat them, they get the extra experience points. So I'm kind of neutral on this. Yeah. I, I, okay. I No, I actually agree. You can, yeah, you can, you can change it. Um, especially because if you look at the monster manual, the hit point, total is actually a range so you could change it to the minimum of the range or the maximum of the range and now granted it is like a bell curve so those going to be like the having the minimum hit points is a long tail type situation uh it should be rare to have the minimum hit points uh same goes with the maximum hit points but it is a range so the dungeon master can set the hit points in that range and still be well within the rules as written. I think in the long term, having a consistent, predictable set of rules that the players understand leads to more fun than prioritizing fun instead. That's going for instant gratification instead of take earning it. 100% agree. This is, these are, this is my thoughts. Like I say, you come to play a game. Dungeons and Dragons is a game. There's a set of rules. Everybody should agree on them. And, you know, I get the, this uh, tendency of the rule of cool, which basically means you can cheat one time, you know, uh, just, just this once I'll let you get away with it. And yeah, that's, that's fine. But in the long term, being consistent with the predictable set of rules. Yeah. Agree. hundred percent. While you should always prioritize fun, please know the rules. This, this speaks to the last one. Yeah, agreed. Know the rules. And speaking of which, I'm going to go ahead and put a link uh, down below that is the free basic rules PDF. It doesn't take you off of YouTube or take you to another website or anything. It's going to be a direct link. Boom, click it. You get the PDF directly downloaded. And it's the Dungeons and Dragons basic rules. So if for whatever reason you don't have the player's handbook or the rules, that's an easy way to get them. You can read through them. It, you know, it's free. But yeah, I'll link the player's handbook down there too. Why not? All right, next up. Don't try to be Mercer, Murphy, or any other big time DM. Be yourself and have fun. Yeah, 100%. Why would you try to be somebody else other than yourself? All right, next up, my style, rulings over rules, imagination over logic, and fun over complexity. Prep situations and not plots. The players will create the story on their own. Not sure. I don't, I agree with the second part. I'm not sure if I agree with the first part. 
Um, I don't because here's why I don't agree with the first part. I don't think imagination and logic are opposed to one another. I don't think fun and complexity are opposed to one another. I think it can be complex and fun. That's p- part of being a nerd is that these things are super complex, super deep, and you get so far into it that's the fun. And then you're playing with like-minded individuals that are so deep down this rabbit hole that you're speaking another language of your thing. You know, your Dungeons and Dragons, Eve Online, I don't know, League of Legends, whatever the the super nerd rabbit hole you're down yeah I, I don't think fun and complexity are opposed uh so i'm, an, I'm neutral on this one always buy your snacks etc the day before traveling to dungeon master i like fresh snacks personally disagree the player is always right about their character you do not get to decide how a pc feels about someone or something if you get caught off guard by a reaction talk to the player you didn't understand something fundamental about their character's mentality or view on something I 100% agree. In fact, this reminds me of a situation where I was running a game and there was some sort of missile attack towards a character's back while they were, while they were running. It was like a, a readied action and then like somebody was shooting at it from behind and I narrated that the character was like hunching over and ducking down trying to avoid the shots as they ran and man, the, the player didn't like that. They said, well, that is what I'm doing, but as you know, I, I should be the one saying that my character is doing that. And it's like, okay, you know, and yeah, I mean... Sure. Most people don't mind if you narrate that their characters, little actions like that. But yeah, I agree. The char- the player is in charge of the character. End of story. That's it. Agree. Sometimes it's good to make your characters feel like powerful heroes by giving them an easy fight. Yeah, I 100% agree. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, I agree with this. And it actually reminds me of like movies because like if you look at some sort of like action movie or superhero movie or something like that, at the beginning of the movie, there's a part usually that I like to call fun in games. Uh, this is very popular in like, say like Spider-Man or something like that. When he, after he first gets his powers, there's always a scene or a sequence of scenes where it's like demonstrating the powers, like swinging around, doing this, stopping a small crime in progress. It's kind of like the fun in games aspect of like, ah, oh, I get to like utilize my powers and this is so cool and, you know the same thing in D&D like you know everybody they, they pick a character because they want to have that awesome character do the things like oh yeah I'm going to cast these spells and like you know incinerate a huge group of enemies whatever they have this idea in their head of like how awesome it's going to be let it let it be awesome and then after they've been awesome for a minute then it's like okay now uh here's what can actually challenge you and that you'll see that that happens in movies as well like like say like a spider-man example after the fun and games portion it always turns out there's something bigger to chew on you know some bigger enemy is not so easily dispatched so yeah agree do the prep work and use software i use fantasy grounds and incarnate but there are a lot of options to take some of the weight off of your shoulders i don't really use software like this i'm i'm a in-person a pencil and paper dungeon master. I, I don't agree nor disagree. I, use whatever works for you. So I'll, I'll go ahead and just say I agree. Yeah, use whatever works for you. Not all tables need to play the same way. What works for others might not work for you. Yeah, I agree. Everybody's different. Every table's different. Every group of friends is different. So agree. What is good for the goose is good for the gander. If you let your NPCs do something, your players are free to do it. And inversely, if your players have a gimmick on occasion, your NPCs can do the same thing. I love this one. So what this is getting at is, you know, these players in the parties, a lot of times they'll come up with a trick or a tried and true strategy that they use every battle. But it, when the NPCs pull the same trick, maybe in the shoes on the other foot, uh, that's when things kind of get interesting. So, you know, say they, you know, say the first thing they always do is hypnotic pattern. Well, at some point there's going to be a group of NPCs casting hypnotic pattern on them. Okay. So, uh, yeah, do it back, you know, <laughs> turn about is fair play. Ooh, players don't care about your story. They want to do cool stuff. Allow them to, it will be fun for all involved. 100% agree. I absolutely agree. They, players don't care about your story. They, they care about their character. That's it. So let them interact with the story, with your world, whatever you want to call it, but don't force it down their throats. And then a good benchmark for this is if you think about when you're using proper nouns. So if you're saying the whatever, whatever kingdom or this ancient hero's name or this certain thing, if you're using a lot of proper nouns, you're kind of venturing into eyes glaze over territory as far as I'm concerned. It's, if you think about it, it's why like the Silmalarian is so dang hard to read is because it's like proper noun, proper noun, proper noun, you know, yeah, that's my little rant. They don't care about your story. Agree. Mistakes happen. Embrace them and learn from them. Fun stories often happen after mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there's no, yeah, always. I mean, I agree with this. Fun stories often happen after mistakes. Yeah, in fact, like in the narrative structure of like, again, going back to movies, there's always a point in the movie where it's like the, they call it like the low point. 
where it's like, there's how they're going to get out from this. You know, it's like the lowest of the low, the team is separated. They've all been disarmed of their weapons. They're sliding down a hill toward lava. You know, think, uh, oh man, here's a perfect example. Remember one of the Toy Story movies and they're going down toward the, the furnace or the crushing machine or whatever it was. That's the low point. So yeah, agree. Try to make most information you give the players actionable or at least relevant in the short to mid term. Sitting there acknowledging backstory or cryptic visions that won't make sense until months later is only fun in small doses. Yeah. Agreed. The characters need to know what to do. Where do we go? Who do we talk to? They, you get some weird mysterious vision of something and yada yada yada. It, it, it really doesn't mean anything if they can't say, all right, let's pack up the horses and we're going north to the volcano. This is a game. You gotta, you gotta, <laughs> yeah, the weird mysterious foreshadowing. Uh, it's cool and all. Like it says, small doses, small doses. Yep, I agree with this 100%. Don't give the players everything they want. Their motivation will evaporate. Yep, agreed. If you've ever uh, typed in the cheat codes on a video game, you'll realize that it kind of ruins playing through the game the regular way. Monster stat blocks are better for inspiration than strict adherence. Never be afraid to give your monsters cool abilities. Done well, the fight will be memorable. Absolutely. I agree with this. I, I do this. I like to give one little special thing to monsters kind of based on their environment or like who their master is, you know, say, say you're finding a group of goblins that are controlled by some sort of sorcerer and they all have a strange symbol on their head. You know, maybe during combat that symbol could glow and then give their group bonus hit points or something like that. Yes. It makes it memorable and cool. Cause then the, the players are like, Oh, those are the ones with the symbol on the head. Oh no, these are just regular ones. They don't have the symbol. It adds depth and, and different things. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, what I would also do is add bonus experience points uh, if you're going to add bonus abilities. Next up, if the party comes up with an out-of-the-box, crazy and super original idea, just let them do it. Okay. Yeah, it depends. It depends what the uh, idea is, but I tentatively agree. That might also be accompanied with just this once. Next time, it's not going to work kind of thing. If they're casting prismatic wall on the ceiling and then casting reverse gravity and, you know that kind of thing. There's got to be some limits on, you know, you got to keep the game playable and not just uh, rep repetitive with the super original idea happening over and over and over. All right. Sometimes it is good to hit your party when they're at their weakest, creating tension from desperation. Absolutely. Agree. But I wouldn't hit them too hard if they're at their weakest, but it could be a good way to, I, I agree. I wouldn't hit them too, too hard, but you know, say they're, you know, say one of them is down, they're retreating this that, and the other it would be kind of like oh no uh one thing on top of another we can't catch a break yeah absolutely make sure the pcs are the protagonists of the story well yeah agree increase the pace of the game by prompting players for action this doesn't just apply to combat do it with all players and use their character names talus you're up what do you do about the screaming orc? Hawk, what are you doing while they argue with the mayor? Et cetera, et cetera. Yep, I agree. This is, goes back to what I was saying earlier about calling on the player, especially if they haven't said anything in a while, especially in larger games. You really need to make sure everybody's participating or they're gonna, you don't want to have people just sitting there bored, man. So yeah, call on people and prompting them for action. And then another good one is how do you feel, asking people how they feel about this or how does their character feel about this? So that kind of gives some interesting things to, you know, to think about and riff off of, because this is this the point of the game is riffing off of other people. So call on people, ask them what they're doing, what they're thinking. Pick a rule set that doesn't make you choose fun. Find rules that help support fun. Mm, I don't really understand what this means. I think this might be coming from a place of, uh, uh, you know, there's a certain group of people that are very much wanting people to try a more variety of rule sets than uh, Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. Yeah, play play other rule sets, but uh, this seems a little, little venomous with a little, it's like passively venomous. Don't prepare a story for the players, but do consider the lore. It helps when allowing the players to write their own story. Yeah, I agree. Don't prepare a story. No, why would you prepare a story for the players? That's like, um, uh, I know there are Dungeon Masters that make a story and all that business, but no, that's that's not my style. So my style is you make your characters, you make the world, usually just a starting town that you're going to start with in level one. I should make a video about that, but you make a town at level one. You know, there's skeletons over here in the graveyard area. You know, there's, man, it's almost like a MMO. There's like a newbie zone. There's, you know, skeletons over here, goblins over here. Oh, look, toward that mountain, there's kobolds. Oh, what if there's a dragon that way? You know, that kind of thing. Then as they're going through this, meeting people, doing things, a story will emerge. It, it's really inevitable in, in a game like this. As they're meeting more characters and discovering new things, a story will emerge. So, agree, absolutely.
You don't tell the story the interactions do. You merely serve as the guide. You provide the frame for the skyscraper. That's what I was just talking about. The interactions with the world will form a story. And I think a lot of dungeon masters sit down and it's like they're almost writing a book. Like, oh, here's Loradon the pure against so-and-so the wicked and yada, 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 and nobody cares. They just want to go and shoot their Eldritch Blast at a freaking goblin and then describe what happens when they reduce it to zero hit points. Next, the party should be given challenges that can't be solved with a fireball, seduction, or combination of the two. <laughs> <laughs> combination of the two. Well, I'm gonna have to agree with that one just for that. Um, yes, the party should be given challenges that can't be solved with fireball subjection or the combination of the two. I agree. Success on a roll does not always mean the action works as intended. If a task is impossible to complete, i.e. trying to jump across a 30 foot wide chasm, success could just mean that they don't die or have other major consequences when their solution fails. Disagree. Uh, if a task is impossible, there should not be a roll, in my opinion. You would just narrate it. Now, you could, if it is like random how much, how far they jump, which I don't think it is in 5e. I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I think it's based on your strength score. It gives you an exact value of how far you jump. The dungeon master could just narrate it. Okay, so you jump 18 feet across the 30-foot wide chasm. You almost get to the far wall, but no, you land in the river below. Uh, splash. Okay. Roll damage. That kind of thing. So, no. If, if a task is impossible, you shouldn't roll. It just causes problems when they roll a 20. If you have a puzzle and you don't have a solve, let the players figure it out. When you like something that they do, that's the solve. Act like that's what you intended. Now, this is a pretty common... I'm going to go ahead and say I agree with this. I, uh, I don't like when you have to do it, but it's... It's a it's a DM trick to get around uh, players that are stumped by a kindergarten level riddle or puzzle. They they come up with something they all think it's the answer and they they smugly present it to you, man. May, maybe if maybe if they've been stuck on it for any you know a few minutes, you know thirty forty five minutes, and you just need to move the game forward, you can let it work. I would say if and only if they need to get past that puzzle to advance something cool. Yeah, if there's like a secret treasure room and it's just off to the side, and no, you got to solve it correctly if you want to get that bonus treasure in my opinion. All right, next up, if you don't play with PCs having an amount of plot armor, make sure the players know. Reinforce and communicate this more than once because some people cannot handle a character death. Oh my gosh. What? Plot armor? No, 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 no. Okay, so I guess I can't even relate to this because you would never have plot armor in one of my games, but I guess people are playing games where the characters just always get captured instead of unalived. Okay, I, I guess I agree that you should communicate it because, yeah, I agree you should communicate it. I do not agree that anybody should ever have plot armor. So I would communicate that you do not have plot armor. And in fact, you might want to think about having a second character with you in your little folder in case your first one, their plot armor crumples. Don't railroad your players. Let them choose their own direction so you can give them a false sense of independence while dropping your encounters in their path. Okay, yeah. You should not rail your road your players, I agree. Okay, this is the this is a standard DM thing that a lot of people do, including myself. This is just how it goes. You kind of have some ideas in your head of like the cool things that could happen, and it doesn't really matter if they go on the north road or the south road. That little cool meeting with the interesting thing that you came up with, it's happening on the north and the south road, wherever they are. So, yeah, I agree. Talk to your players. Ask them what they think is going on or what they want to do. Lots of on-point, fun ideas to be had from knowing what your players are into. Absolutely. Yeah, so one of the things I always do, and even occasionally do, not even just in the first game or whatever, I'll kind of go around the table and say, or even in private, a uh, one-on-one, -on -one, ask, so what are you wanting to accomplish in Dungeons & Dragons? You know, and you'll come up, every player is going to have a different thing that they say. And, you know, some of it's just, just hang on with my friends and play the game, have fun. That's fine. And then some are, well, I want to build a giant treehouse mansion and have animal guards in my druid enclave. You know, they're going to have different ideas of what they want to do and what they're into. And then you can kind of steer it into the direction of maybe some of those dreams could come true. Always roll behind a screen. If you have to fudge or full-on lie about your roll, your player should never know about it. And don't be afraid to twist your universe to fit your story if it makes it better for your players. Better doesn't mean more unicorns and roses. Better means more dramatic tension and challenges. They will have more fun storming a castle than riding off into the sunset on the back of a unicorn. So first off, I don't roll behind a screen. I don't fudge my rolls. Uh, it is what it is. The dice say what they say. However, that doesn't mean I don't twist the universe <laughs> in the story. So um, I guess I disagree, but I get where they're coming from, if that makes sense. When you make up an NPC, jot down their name, location, voice, hidden plot point. 
you'll forget this stuff later and your players will bring them up unexpectedly. Yeah, so what I do is I have a, um, a little flip book of note cards and every time I kind of uh, instantiate a new character place thing, I will make a note card for it. That way I can flip through the little note card book and come up with anything I wrote down and forgot about weeks later. So yeah, I agree. The most important rule, the golden rule, if you will, you are the DM, you are in control. Don't like a rule in the book, throw it out or change it. Fudge dice rolls in favor of your players in the story. Rules and dice are guidelines, not set in stone. Uh, I agree, but I also disagree with fudging the dice rolls and stuff like that. So, but you can, I mean, there's, yeah, you can. So I, I mean, I guess I agree with this. But I wouldn't fudge dice rolls because, like I say, we're here to play a game. Uh, we're not here to, you know, play, you know, pretendo. We're we're playing a game. You know, you can sit around and role play with your friends without dice and rules. So, yeah, I agree, though. Rules are what make the game fair for everybody at the table. And understanding of the rules and expectations allows for the greatest enjoyment of gameplay for all players. Yeah, I agree with this one. Um, uh, and again, um, a lot of, there's this, co you know, a common thought that a, that a lot of people jump into a game, they haven't even read the rules, they don't understand the rules, they don't know what their character can do. It's true. It's true. And so, to alleviate that problem, in the description box, again, I've linked a basic rules PDF and a link to the player's handbook down there. So, yeah, check it out if you want, whatever, you know, or don't. It's up, it's up to you. Have a list of available wild shapes for the druid, because a T-Rex does not qualify as a 1-4 CR creature. It's a CR-8, FYI. I thought there was a list in the player's handbook. I could be wrong. So, I guess I agree. All right. Yes and is always cooler than no because. Not every fight has to be hard. It's okay to let your players feel like capable adventurers because they are. I agree with the second part. The first part, I guess it's an opinion, but I guess I agree with it. I've always heard yes and and no but, but I guess you could say it no because, but I've always, I've always heard it as yes and and no but. So it's like, no, you can't jump across the chasm, but, you know, you can grab a vine or whatever on the other side and now you're dangling, you know, so this kind of thing. So it's like, it, it's not like a total hard rejection, but it's like a, a no, but then, you know, a slight. So it's not like a total hard rejection, but there is something that moves the story forward or moves the action forward rather than just a, a roadblock. Game design doesn't when you sit down to play. Adjust as you go along for the good of the game and the player's experience. 100% agree. Uh, you're constantly, you're the man behind the curtain moving the levers. You gotta make, make all the, the pieces fit and make it fun. Agree. Item names don't need to be normal. Get creative with your homebrew. Absolutely. And uh, even, you know, even down to the point of like, I described the gold piece. So I have a kind of this rule. I actually make a video on this. Everything in my world gets two descriptions when I talk about it. Two. And I, I just mentally make sure I say two things about it. So they pick up a gold piece. Or they find some gold. Or they pick up some gold. It's not just, oh, you found 50 gold pieces. It's, you found 50 pieces of dull gold with a dwarven hammer si symbol, you know, embossed on them. That thing. So dull, so they're not shiny. And then, like, a dwarven hammer symbol. Two descriptions. That's it. Quick. And it really brings it to life rather than just uh, a friggin' integer that increments on your character sheet. You know what I mean? So, anyway. Yeah, agree. Time in the game world doesn't have to freeze between sessions. Events in the game world can progress during downtime, giving players new dynamics to be faced with next time. I like this. I don't do it. I don't have time progress when the players are not playing. It would be interesting. It'd be an interesting way to run a campaign. I don't do it, though. I agree that it... Okay, but I agree with it. Time in the game doesn't have to freeze. I agree with it, though. All right. Don't railroad. Don't think the solution to railroading is to only allow the story to go forward in the way you planned. Like sitting quietly and shooting down everything the players want to do until they say the right thing. I agree. This is like the quintessential railroad argument essentially the players almost throw up their hands and say well what do you want us to do like where are we supposed to go that kind of thing like it's yeah i get it it's like when you're trying to run horde of the dragon queen or princes of the apocalypse yeah those it's, it, on those adventures it's it's hard to get the players to do the right thing sometimes <laughs> don't be afraid to not make it equal if that guy likes combat more give him more baddies to fight that one likes role play lock them in a room where we're they have to investigate etc i wouldn't separate the party but i guess i agree um i would maybe lock the party in the room where they have to investigate um yeah agree not every encounter should lead to a fight it's okay to throw situations that are more than deadly at your players before a boss fight make sure you wear down the party if it's at full strength they will roll over most monsters yeah yeah this is uh it's supposed to be a real world and real worlds are not 
quote unquote balanced. However, you're playing a game. So this is a tough one because how do you put up that, that little red flag? Ding, ding, ding. Hey, this, this encounter is going to be deadly. Uh, maybe be careful. I guess you just got to use foreshadowing and then clues, you know, say they're, you know, say they're walking into the lair of something and then like they're seeing like the scattered remains of scores of adventuring parties with cooler looking armor and cooler looking weapons broken and shattered. It looks like these guys are stronger than you are and they are uh, sitting here uh, piled up at the entrance to this cave. So maybe this is a dangerous place. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be a uh, fight either. Running away is always an option, but I've, in my experience, uh, adventuring parties don't like to run away. I love to look my PCs dead in the eye with as much drama as I can muster and say, clickety clackety, roll to attackity. I'm going to go ahead and say I wholeheartedly agree with this. Moving on. No matter how thought out your NPCs, undoubtedly the players will want to know everything but their backstory. Prepare by thinking of the most useless random questions possible. Don't get upset when the players care nothing for your well thought out NPCs. Yeah. I agree. They're going to want to know, oh, what is, where is your brother from? You know, what? where is your farm? What kind of crops do you grow? Is there any fish in that lake? You know, yeah, agree. Give everything a name and special feature to make it interesting. Involve every player. Make it fun. Yeah, I agree. And like I say, I give everything two details. So if they're approaching a tower, it's going to be a twisted gray tower with green ivy crawling up the side, you know. So it, it, it's always going to be at least two details. And then you can go, if you want to go beyond that with your descriptions, try to make the other details. So like two visual details and then go beyond with like uh, how, you, how it makes you feel or how it smells. Or That's what I do. To create meaningful, engaging combat, try coming up with stakes and motivations for the involved parties that go beyond kill the other guys. Kill or be killed is fine, too, but there's more options from the top of my head. Don't let them escape or escape. Destroy or protect the thing. Defend until or capture before. Stop. Complete the ritual. Some other action. Take the thing. Don't let them take the thing. Yeah, I agree. These things make, uh, especially makes boss fights cooler, where it's like, oh, look, we're just going to surround this guy and beat him down, or like he's going to get away, or... Yeah, but if it's like, you know, the most classic is there's a ritual going on, you got to stop the ritual. Yeah, I agree with this. Some, if not most, of the things going on in your game should not wait for the players to get involved. Advance your narrative threads with or without the players. Now, this touches on something somewhat near and dear to my heart, uh, where I, I like to do, whenever I start a campaign, I like to think of three main bad guys or, or evil forces. You know, it could be like a, a goblin king is one of the main ones. Then there could be a drow matron mother could be another one. And then say there's a, a red dragon. And as the players are going into the underdark fighting the drow, and stopping the raids on the elven villages, the Goblin King is expanding his territory, and the Dragon is expanding his territory. And then you'll actually notice when they get back to town, little rumors of like, oh, the, the goblins are, the activity is increased in the, in the north. And then, oh, this, the dragon's been seen flying around doing this while you were gone. And, and it, it's almost like a, a juggling act because <laughs> they do kind of one of the threads or one of the, I go against one of the enemies, the, uh, the other ones grow. So it can actually get kind of, kind of interesting, you know, so they, they lay off of the drow for a minute to go deal with the, the forces of the dragon. And then, uh, the, then the drow start kind of reinforcing their, their old positions and stuff like that. Anyway, that's kind of the, one of the things I, I like to do and that makes the world seem like things are moving in the background. Know the system you run good enough to make quick decisions. Check specifics later after the session. <laughs> reading the grammar is fun. Uh, I have to like mentally not correct myself because I'm reading verbatim. Okay, so yes, I tend to agree. However, if some things are easy to look up, especially with the internet, you can quickly type in your phone and find out uh, how far you can jump if you have 18 strength. You know, those things are, I say you can look those up during the game. If you're looking up some thing where you have to read more than two minutes, one minute, then no, don't do it. Keep the game moving. Everybody's, you know, don't respect people's time. You know, respect people's time. Players make characters they want to play. They have skills they want to highlight. Challenge what they have, not what you think they should be. And for the love of God, don't spend your time making encounters that attack a player's weakness, character's weakness. I agree with this, especially when I was talking about the fun and game section of a movie kind of deal. You want to let that archer dude shoot a bunch of arrows and bullseye some people or some enemies, you know, and save the day. You want to let that divination caster see the future and, and use his, you know, when he rolled a one, he can turn the guy's critical hit into a critical fail. Yeah, you want to let them use their powers to enjoy their character, their 
the the fun for the players is enjoying their cool character they made and then narrating how it happens and yeah and now as far as attacking character weaknesses i would attack a character's weakness if it was a boss fight of a of a campaign kind of thing and there was maybe clues given that they were being surveilled you know you know say they intercepted a, a letter or a note that was explaining the tactics they used and it was addressed to the, the the main bad guy or whatever. It's like they're they're even in the background. They're talking about our tactics and and our strengths and weaknesses. And they're yeah, I, I could see him coming up with a counter uh, at, a, at a crucial moment. But I wouldn't just do the classic DM screw job, you know, kind of thing. And don't yeah, make it make it epic. You're doing a better job than you think you are. Don't second guess yourself. Your players will let you know. Yeah, you are, man. You're doing a better job than you think you are. You really are. You heard it from me. I recently saved a PC from decapitation critical hit bugbear from a goblin minstrel due to the size difference. I severed his leg off instead. I didn't know there was decapitation critical hits. Maybe it's a vorpal sword or something. Does that even exist in 5e? I don't know. This is not really a tip. This is just something the guy said that he did. So I guess I'm neutral? Uh, I don't know. If a PC action activity they can conceivably achieve doesn't have a consequence for failing or succeeding or isn't, isn't restricted by time, don't ask for a roll. Well, yeah, yeah, this is... DMing 101 right here. This is, a, this is a great DM tip. I agree. If they can't fail, don't roll. If they can't succeed, don't roll. If they have all the time in the world to try to do something that just takes time, like, I don't know, balancing a sword on the, on its end and you just gotta, gotta keep trying to get it right. Something like that. I don't know. Yeah, just let them do it. Um, now you might say, you might roll for how long it takes. You know, something like that. Like, if it says it isn't restricted by time, you know, but maybe they got to do this, balance this thing on this thing in the next 10 minutes or, you know, it activates a trap or something. Yeah, you'd probably roll to see, you know, it took eight minutes instead of 10 minutes. Oh, good job, guys. Okay. Yeah, agree. Looking up rules is part of the game. It absolutely is. Agree. Give players magic items. Even if you got to crank up the intensity of encounters a bit, players love having new shiny things to fiddle with. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Every every treasure hoard should have some kind of magic item. This is Dungeons and Dragons, man. And you got to make it cool, too. Not just, yes, you got a plus one dagger, yada, yada, but you got to have something cool with it, man. Make the, make the plus one dagger glow in the moonlight. Make the plus one dagger really cold in their hand. You know, just something. Something to make it extra cool. Don't be afraid of character deaths. The PCs do not have the right to win every fight. I agree. It, it is what it is, man. That I say what they say. Bring an extra character. Now, it's up to you. Um, you know, do you, how, how do they generate the new character? Are there any restrictions on that? Yeah, bring a backup character. Can you have a conversation in public and not be kicked out? Do you dress appropriately in public? Are you a good fit? What are your RP expectations? Schedule, like a job interview. I don't really know what this means. Um, I don't see how this is a DM tip, but you should definitely try to dress appropriately in public, I guess. Neutral. Even if you're running a pre-written campaign, don't be afraid to add your own spin on the content. The goal is for everyone to have fun at the end of the day. Yeah, you have to. Anybody who's run a pre-written campaign or a module or whatever, they know they have to do this. The players are going to go off the rails and you have to subtly get them where they need to go in a non railroady fashion, if that makes sense. Um, you got to make them kind of want to do the right thing. And now running a module, the players kind of have to realize, hey, we're we're running this adventure. We're not going off into La La Land. Right? We're running Horde of the Dragon Queen. We're chasing the, the treasure chest across the Forgotten Realms. This is the adventure. So there's kind of a, a little bit of an unspoken agreement there, or maybe explicitly spoken agreement. But yeah, put your own spin on it. You got to. You, you're going to have to to make it work. You'll, you'll see. Reward creativity. Give inspiration when someone does something either dope as... Or recklessly in character. Yeah, I I, I agree. Reward creativity. Yeah, you know, inspiration isn't really that powerful anyway. So if it makes somebody feel good, <laughs> give it out. The players will go off script. Plan accordingly. Yes, they will. I agree. It is the player's story in the DM's world, not the DM's story. This is wise advice. Wise, wise advice. Think about it. Let that sink in. Yeah. Absolutely. Give the party a pet. Parties love pets. <laughs> In my experience, the party is going to just find a pet no matter what you do. It's okay to let the party overwhelm something at first. It'll be a good way to gauge the teamwork and or them individually. Yeah, it's the fun and games section of the of the movie. You got to let them show off their powers. Let the fighter shield bash the dude and 
It'll be awesome. Yeah, you gotta let them do it. Know your material, but be ready to toss it off a cliff at a moment's notice. Yeah, I would say 90% of the game is improvisation. It really is. You gotta be able to think on your feet. It, it's just what it takes to be a dungeon master. Make sure that you are having fun too. It is easy to forget that you are also playing the game. Yeah, you gotta have fun, man. Have, really have fun with it. Just go out there and have fun, guys. I agree. The world advances off screen, and not only when the players interact with it. Things they ignore will still have a life and death of their own. This will help your world feel alive. Yes, that goes back to what I was saying about having the, the different forces at work in the background. Yes, it's, it's very cool to do that, in my opinion. Uh, having, oh, when they get back to the town, there was a, oh, look, there's a new mayor. Uh, the other guy got kicked out of town. He's accused of fraud. Oh, look, let's, oh, it seems like the accusations were false and the new mayor's a bad guy. Yes, these kind of things happen and, and you just, you make the world change when they, they've been gone a while and they get to a place. It's, you gotta make it change a little bit. You know, we're not, this is not a video game. Ignore 80% of this list and just play your table, not everyone else's. No, I like this list. That's why I made the video. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, sure. Play your table, though. Let everyone have a moment in the spotlight. Yep, covered it. Always have more than one thing going on. Let your players choose what they get involved with and how. Yep, these are starting to show a pattern. Set your ego aside. That's just good advice in general, so I'm going to say I agree. Don't plan too much. Yeah, I agree. You shouldn't do anything too much. You're in charge of the game, not the people playing it. Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to... You don't want to overstep your bounds and be that guy. Yeah, you're in charge of the game, not the people playing it. Don't don't think you're their boss, because you're not. Always have a so-now-you're-dead narrative and short-term side quest ready for an accidental TPK. That way they think it's a plot hook. I don't really understand this one. Have a now-you're-dead narrative and short-term side quest. Uh, I guess I'm neutral. I don't understand it. Don't let them see the railroad. I don't know what you're talking about. Agree. Make sure you have fun also. Agree. As a DM, it is better to have a list of bullet points that you want to get done that session than to have everything meticulously planned out. The players will sabotage that in the first 10 minutes, and you really don't want to railroad. Yeah, absolutely. This is the way to do it. You have to kind of just have a sense of the world and the characters and how it would respond to various actions and actions that you can't predict. You just, yeah, I agree with this. The rules are fun, though. Yep, I agree. And again, in the description, I got the rules linked. And then all that good stuff, so check it out. Never say no to your players. Just say, you can try, but it's very unlikely. I disagree um, with this one. Um, some things are impossible, and they should know beforehand, uh, so they don't try to do something that's impossible. Um, if you roll a 20, it doesn't let you jump 300 feet. Um, I'm sorry, not at my table. If the dice are messing up your story, fudge the rolls. Disagree. The dice represent fate, and fate sometimes messes up uh, what was otherwise a beautiful story shattered by fate. Don't fudge your rolls. Wink, wink. Make notes. Yeah, you should make notes. I agree. In fact, the Dungeon Master absolutely should take notes, and generally it's probably a good idea for one of the players to be a note taker as well. But whatever. Uh, they don't have to. It's on them if they forget the dude's name or whatever. Everything can mean something. Somehow. Yep, that's why I always add two details to things. And of those details, usually... <laughs> a lot when you when you add two details to everything in the whole game you're gonna find that those things start leading down to little rabbit trails of different possibilities you know like what's what is the dwarven hammer on the coin oh wow that was an ancient dwarven kingdom what happened to it oh obviously it collapsed but what caused this collapsed and this that and the other oh look here's the ruins next thing you know just describing a coin turned into an adventure in some dwarven ruins you get what i'm saying so yeah just give everything two details and then the little details can sometimes lead to really cool things you never even expected. Serve the story. The world keeps going when the PCs aren't looking. NPCs also have things they want to accomplish. Most big bad evils think they are the good guy. Absolutely. Yeah. Like back to my example, you know, say that my drow matron mother down there in the underworld, she is in charge of getting wood down to the drow city. And she is just making money for her family by getting wood from the surface and bringing it and importing it down. That's all she wants to do. But in order to do that, well, guess what? Now there's little daytime elves that don't like her cutting down the forest with her with her dudes, and it turns into a conflict. And yeah, everybody has their own goals. Agree. Know the rules so the game is fair, and so that if you change a rule, you understand what the repercussions will be. Yep. You got to. You got to. A lot of... I'm not going to say a lot. Some people change the rules because they have fun changing the rules and they have this great idea. A good example is critical fail tables, which are undoubtedly a very bad game design. Don't. The repercussions are horrible. Learn the rules. Again, I link the rules in the description. You click the thing, uh, the PDF downloads straight to your computer and you read them and then you know the rules. Enjoy. Allow homebrew if it's not broken or if a PC is set on using it, work with them to nerf it. Uh, 
I mean, case by case basis on this one, but I'll, I'll agree with it. Yeah, work with your work with your players. It depends what it is, man. Like if they're wanting to come in and be Ryu from Street Fighter Two or something, just no, you can't throw a Hadouken, but you can be an elemental monk, and I guess you get powers or something. I don't know. A lot of the homebrew is broken, so case by case, I'll, I'll tentatively agree. If you end up house ruling something, write it down in case it pops up again in a different season. <laughs> yeah. Uh, session. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, the players are going to remind you, though, if it works to their advantage, and they'll conveniently forget if it doesn't work to their advantage. So there's that. Prioritize player fun over your homebrew world. Well, yeah, they don't care about your world. Agree. Player interests trump main plot. There really maybe shouldn't be a main plot. Does a world have a plot? I don't know. Just let the players play and have fun, and storylines will emerge uh, without you having to write a plot. You're not writing a book, you know? You're, right, you're just playing a game. All right, set any house rules on game day zero so everyone knows the rules changes up front. Well, yeah, you don't want to be like, you know, this is a, the classic one is like, oh, I'm going to do a sneak attack. And they're like, oh, well, no, you got to be hidden to do a sneak attack. It, like, what do you mean? You know, you, yeah, you got to, you have to set the rules up front because what are we even doing here? If Yeah, agree. It's all right to kill PCs, not intentionally. I agree. But I mean, the monsters are trying to kill the PCs intentionally. So, and you're controlling the monsters. So it is what it is, man. Nat 20 is a nat 20, no matter the circumstances. Hence rule one, let the players have fun. I don't know what that means. If, the, if this comment is trying to say that a natural 20 always succeeds, then I guess I disagree, but the problem is is that you should not even be rolling the dice if success is not possible. So I would guess it's true. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you roll the dice and you roll a natural 20, it's probably going to be a success because the Dungeon Master would not call for that roll if success was impossible if they're playing correctly. So I guess I agree. It is okay to say no to bad players. Yeah, you got to set your boundaries, man. Just, you know, this is... Uh, just because you're playing D&D &D doesn't mean that the rules of polite society go out the window. Agree. Always follow the rules, no matter what. Okay, I, I, I am. A, I do like the rules. However, no, sometimes you, you can never say never, as, as, a, as a wise man once said. All right, next. No plot armor. The fear of character death creates and invokes more feeling and appreciation than invulnerable full heroes. Okay, yeah. I agree. The, I, even the concept of plot armor is th pretty foreign and alien to me. I mean, what are we talking about? Like, we know Captain Picard's not going to die because there's like six more seasons of Star Trek. Like, no, you're, this is Dungeons and Dragons, dude. Like, uh, <laughs> watch out. If you step on a trap, bad things could happen. I agree. Don't be a rules lawyer. Well, I haven't passed the rules bar exam, so I guess, uh, I guess that's, that's out of the question, but don't know if I agree. I'm neutral. I don't know. Legendary actions, saves, and lair actions are your friends. Yeah. Yes, it's it's sometimes hard to remember these things. So if you go, if you know you're going to be fighting a, a boss level CR type monster, you have to remember your your legendary actions and your lair actions and stuff. It, it, it's tough to remember sometimes, but you got to remember it. I think even uh, I think Matt Mercer even said that he has a little note sticky card on his uh, DM screen that says lair actions. Ask your players what they want to experience in the campaign. I agree with this. Um, like I say, I, I go around the table and ask what they what they want out of Dungeons and Dragons in in general, and that kind of tends to uh, uh, focus our thoughts. And that's it. Let's uh, tally up the score and see how we did. Subscribe.